Tonight on Stand Up For The Week, Jack Whitehall, Kevin Bridges, Andy Osho, Rich Hall, and special guest, Mark Watson. for the week with the best comedians take on the week's news I'm Patrick Keelty and these are the big stories of the week folks we we begin with news that the uh, the Tories are about to get tough on the number of immigrants and undesirables coming into Britain and I, I say about time too only this week this bunch of unwanted scum managed to sneak in undetected <laughs> not even under the cover of darkness the bloody cheek. <laughs> By the way, if we've, uh, if we've any suicide bombers watching this, um, that flight back from South Africa, that was the one we'd have been happy for you to have a crack at. <laughs> we, uh, we would have let that one slide, honestly. You could have turned up at check-in for that flight in a, in a burka, box cutters, and your Y-fronts bubbling like a junior chemistry set. <laughs> Security would have went, on you go, you're grand. <laughs> Knock yourself out. <laughs> well done, Mr. Cameron, yes. Let's keep thousands of foreigners out who want to come here to work and let back in 23 Englishmen that haven't done a tap for a month <laughs> and are now going to bugger off and hold me because they're all so tired. <laughs> they're all so tired. Yes, Wayne Rooney's already gone on holiday. Just this afternoon, he was spotted chilling in the pool with... Uh... <laughs> I was, uh, I was surprised they lost to Germany because uh, people were saying before the game that England were definitely going to win. Why? Is it because you're technically better or you have a better coach or you have you a secret plan? Oh, no, Paddy. We're playing in red. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sign, Paddy. The last time we wore red, oh, we beat the Germans and we won the World Cup. Who knew, eh? Millions spent on Fabio Capello, and all we needed all along was Gokwan. It's a... <laughs> What's going on? It's the same in the tennis, isn't it? Oh, Murray's gonna win. Why? Because he's better than Federer? Has he worked out the Nadal backhand? No, because the Queen came to Wimbledon, Paddy. It's a sign! <laughs> the Queen hasn't been in 33 years. It's a sign, it's a sign. Yes, the Queen hasn't been to Wimbledon in 33 years. I, I, I think that is a sign. It's a... Uh... It's a sign that the Queen doesn't give a shit about tennis, really, isn't it? <laughs> if the Queen Mother turned up at Wimbledon, that's a sign! <laughs> I, uh, I love Andy Murray, but then again, you know, I do. Any Andy Murray fans in? <laughs> eh? Yeah? I love him, but you see, that's because uh, I'm, I'm Irish, obviously. English people don't like him as much because he's not really one of them. He's a... Uh, he's a... Uh, he's a winner. Um, <laughs> listen to yourselves! The greatest tennis player we produced in 80 years, oh, and you still don't like him, eh? <laughs> and, and what's the excuse? What's the best we can do, eh? Oh, he's... No! He's grumpy and scruffy, <laughs> eh? You know, to be fair, Andy Murray is. He's a bit grumpy, he's a bit scruffy. If, if Gordon Brown shagged Susan Boyle, we probably couldn't produce anyone more grumpy <laughs> or scruffy. Dan. Try not to picture that, by the way. That's uh, <laughs> Gordon Brown on top of Subu. That, that, no, that's wrong. Oh, I think Gordon Brown and uh, Susan Boyle could actually be the same person, you know, because what do you think? Has anyone actually ever seen them in the same room at the same time? <laughs> It's time to crack on with celebrity news, folks, from a man who is living proof that Russell Brand once shagged Robert Patterson. He's... He's young, he's handsome, he's funny. If you want more reasons to hear him, press the red button now. Please welcome Jack Whitehall! <laughs> So, 
So I'm here to talk to you about uh, celebrity news, entertainment. Uh, one of the big stories, obviously, Glastonbury. Yeah, Glastonbury. Oh, we got some people that went. It's very hungover cheers there. Uh, the big story from Glastonbury was that you too had to pull out because Bono uh, injured his back. Yeah, he's uh, actually having to have surgery on his spine. But you know, hey ho, I imagine my spine would be pretty screwed as well if I'd spent the last 20 years with my head up my arse. <laughs> People do this, oh yeah, everyone was really upset that you two pulled out of Glaston. No, they weren't. I've never met a U2 fan in my entire life. Not even in Ireland. I did a gig in Dublin, right? The week that they were playing there, their hometown, for the first time in five years, I went on stage, I said, so who's excited about going to see U2? Complete silence. <laughs> Only broken by one man who decided in that moment to become the voice of an entire nation at the back, just shouted out, ah, no, we all think he's a smoke fucker as well. <laughs> They've had some good news, though, you two. They got put on the Forbes list, I don't know if anyone saw this, of the 100 most powerful celebrities in the world, alongside people like Madonna, Lady Gaga, Tiger Woods. I mean, rich, yes, but powerful, no. They've got no powers whatsoever. I mean, how good would that lot be if Dr. Octopus was attacking the city of New York? <laughs> oh, look at you, he's killing everyone quickly. Someone get Madonna, she's gonna dot one of his arms. Whilst Lady Gaga just coshes him over the back of the head with her cock, and Tiger Woods gets Mrs. Octopus pregnant. Yippee! <laughs> Rubbish. We've all done that thing, you know, with the, with the superpowers. We're like, oh, what superpower would you most like to have? I did it with my mates down the pub recently. Most of them were like, yeah, power to fly or like x ray vision so I can look at tits. <laughs> Everyone except my mate Joss, who when asked what superpower you would have, straight away said laser eyes. I was like, oh, what? Like Cyclops and X-Men? No, nah, laser eye surgery, because, you know, my vision is shit. <laughs> so, hey, that's not a superpower, Joss. That's upgrading a power you already have. <laughs> not even a power, a sense. That's like me getting asked, Chat, what superpower would you have? Um, Spanish as a second language. <laughs> what else has been going on? Cheryl Cole, she's dropping her surname of Cole and going back to being Tweedy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's been a lot of rubbish written about their breakup. The worst thing I saw was that it said, Ashley Cole, in doing what he's done to Cheryl, has ruined his reputation. I was like, no, he hasn't. It's Ashley Cole. He hasn't got a reputation to ruin. <laughs> The last two weeks before that happened, he was in the newspapers first for getting in a brawl outside a nightclub, the time after that for sending photographs of himself naked to strangers. Saying that this has ruined his reputation is a bit like going, oh, do you hear about that Robert Mugabe? Yeah, he doesn't recycle. <laughs> Ashley Cole made a mistake, but everyone makes mistakes. Cheryl makes mistakes. If you think back to The Last X Factor, she made mistakes every week. She spent the entire time to Joe McHale, I don't know whether you remember, going, Oh, Joe, pet, you're just like my little brother, pet, you're just like my little brother. <laughs> Which little brother would that be, Cheryl? Would it be Andrew Tweedy, convicted of armed robbery and assault? <laughs> No, because X Factor is still going strong. They're filming it at the moment. And uh, obviously, the other reality TV show that's still it is Big Brother, its last ever series of Big Brother. Yeah. I watched a couple of episodes, and every time I watch it, there's one person I feel sorry for, and that person is Marcus Bentley. Now, a lot of you won't know who Marcus Bentley is. He is the Geordie guy that does the voiceover. Now, I'm thinking, I've met him a couple of times. He's a very nice fella. He's had steady employment for 10 years, and now suddenly, he hasn't got a job. I feel sorry for him. Like, dear 88 of Marcus is in forced retirement. He sat at home on the sofa doing nout, eating bot noodle, and watching 28 Days Later. <laughs> Marcus, I'm going out to the supermarket. Market. Mrs. Bentley has just announced that she's planned to go and spend the entire luxury shopping budget. Luxury shopping budget, Marcus? I'm going to Lidl. I don't know why I'm going to Lidl, because we haven't got any money, because you haven't got off your fat ass and found a job. You useless shit, you on live TV, would you please not swear? We're not on live TV, Marcus. When will you get into your thick skull? There's no more Big Brother, there's no more Diary Room, and there is no more Davina, and there's also no more me. I'm leaving you, Marcus, and I'm taking the kids. Who goes? You decide. <laughs> uh, you guys have been lovely, and I hope you have an amazing night because everyone else is fantastic. So thanks very much. Good night.
Okay, next it's uh, it's time for our World Cup report. Brought to you from a man who went to Heathrow to applaud the entire England squad home on behalf of the Scottish nation. Yes. Please welcome Kevin Bridges. <laughs> To be back for the second week, what a World Cup it's been. There's been some major talking points this week. Eh? Paraguay versus Japan, what a game. <laughs> England are gone, they're out. England are out, the World Cup. <laughs> when that fourth goal went in, England was silent. Was so silent that even the people in Cornwall could hear Scotland laughing. <laughs> Fair play to the England team, though. Fair play to the England team. Fair play to the England players for taking the pressure off Rob Green by uniting together and fucking it up as one. <laughs> Good to see some team spirit back in the camp. But I will say one thing. At full time on Sunday, at full time, every man, woman and child in England felt that, you know, that overwhelming feeling of disappointment anger and justice, that, that <laughs> sensation that there is absolutely nothing in the future to look forward to or be excited about. That was then. You English people got a feeling of what it's like to be fucking Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> As a nation, we're in that sort of emotional state every single day. <laughs> uh, except at full time on Sunday when we cheered up to a state of mild depression. <laughs> It was England's best chance to win the World Cup in years. It was supposed to be the golden generation. Do we hear that one? The golden generation. The golden generation was so mercilessly pissed on by the Germans. It will now be forever remembered as the golden shower. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Lampard's goal. It could have changed the game. Do you think it crossed? I, I, I never actually seen it myself, but I heard it maybe across the line. No, Frank Lampard's goal, they reckon it could have changed the game. It could have made a 4-1 defeat. 4-2, so... <laughs> the England players are calling for the introduction of video evidence. I think the England players should be careful what they wish for. Oh. <laughs> uh, video evidence involving the English football team. I'm thinking of surveillance cameras in the nightclubs of Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it could be some pretty disturbing footage if we're using video evidence to decide if something a football player's done has crossed the line. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, it's been a World Cup of excuses as well. Was anybody fed up hearing the excuses? Uh, the referee, obviously, was a bit valid on Sunday. I'll give you that, the excuses. But, but the vuvuzelas and the altitude and the controversial new ball. It's, it's a ball, isn't it? It's a ball. We're playing football. We've got a ball. It would be, be controversial if they decided to use a fucking shuttlecock. <laughs> A shuttlecock with a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad on the side. That would be controversial. <laughs> uh, not everybody else, a few other teams have had a tough time. French, the French team, they, they, they had a big fallout with the coach. We've got, we got a French guy in. Were you disappointed in your team, sir? The French team, they, they fell out with the coaches, is that right? And then the players, they went on strike. The French team went on strike. They couldn't have done anything more stereotypically French. <laughs> <laughs> Where was Scotland at home fucking laughing at you? <laughs> <laughs> Got it sky plush to show my grandchildren. What a day that was. <laughs> England Team Hotel was also robbed. Did we see that? Five, five members of staff at the England Team Hotel were jailed for robbing the player. They never mentioned which player's rooms were robbed, but the, the items included underwear, cash, and a FIFA gold medal. That was the items. I don't think anybody, I think we need to ask the question, where the fuck did the FIFA gold medal come from? Huh? <laughs> Obviously, one of the players had stole that in the first place. <laughs> I'm not one for. <laughs> 
We don't know what player's room it was. I'm not one for regional stereotypes, but for me, it's between Stephen Gerrard, Wayne Rooney and Jamie Carragher. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that for England. The players, the players returned home from South Africa, dejected and disappointed, but looking forward to getting home to the comfort of each other's wives. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week. Cheers. Still to come, we got Rich Hall, Andy Osho, and Peter Shelton. We'll see you back after these. Welcome back to Stand Up for the Week. Still to come, we got Andy Osho and the wonderful Mark Watson. But first, a man who's as American as apple pie and anal bleaching. Yes. He's grizzlier than Alan Sugar's scrotum, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we know you're going to love him. Please welcome Mr. Rich Hall. Yeah. 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 How many of you have seen Alan Sugar's scrotum, huh? That Al, yes. Al Gore, the ex-American vice president, waxen-headed, Fucking chunk of human man meat. <laughs> Big fat, flubby Tennessee pork fat piece of shit global warming eco warrior Al Gore. The man who won an Academy Award for best PowerPoint presentation, Al Gore. <laughs> the man who likes to suggest put a brick in your toilet, that'll help. Thanks, Al. Put a brick in all nine of your toilets, a mansion-dwelling piece of shit. What the fuck is wrong with you? He's getting a divorce uh, from his wife of 40 years, Tipper. Uh, there are rumors of infidelity. Apparently, he was caught fucking a tree. Now, some, uh, some woman has come forth, a uh, massage therapist in Portland, Oregon, and has claimed that about a year ago, uh, she was giving Al a massage, and uh, he got a bit randy. And... Uh, there's now a 72-page dossier explaining the entire event. And according to the woman's testimony, Al Gore turned into a sex-crazed poodle. <laughs> so even in sexual frenzy, Al Gore does no better than being a fucking poodle. <laughs> Most of us have been violated by a poodle at some point in our lives. It's just a little fluff trying to nail its fucking piece of lipstick tube against your ankle. <laughs> you just, get the fuck off. Oh, I'm gonna need therapy for this. I've been violated beyond all means. The fuck off! <laughs> so I guess it's just one more of those uh, series of animal attacks that have been plaguing the nation, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, here in London about uh, two weeks ago, you probably read about this, uh, a couple are in Hackney uh, watching TV in their front room with the front door wide open. <laughs> they hear noise upstairs, they go upstairs and a fox is, is biting their kids. Now, a lot of people are shocked by that. Uh, I'm shocked by the fact that a couple lives in fucking Hackney <laughs> and sits there with the fucking door wide open, goes upstairs, comes downstairs, and all their shit is still there. But that story is all over the papers in Britain. In America, that would be nothing. I think a woman got her head bit off by a coyote yesterday, and I had to go into fucking Google to find that out, right? <laughs> in America, you have to be attacked by a celebrity animal before it makes the paper. <laughs> the animal has to have TV credits of some type, or be a performer. The SeaWorld, the uh, killer whale in SeaWorld, who attacked its trainer and drowned it, uh, that was a shocking story to most Americans because they went, how could that happen? Oh, how could a killer whale kill someone? Jeez, I don't know. Maybe the uh, clue there was in the name of the thing. It's a killer whale! <laughs> Animals have dignity for fuck's sake. A sea world killer whale, you take him out of his natural environment and his thought pattern, which is swim, eat, kill something, swim, eat, sleep, kill something. <laughs> Put him in a fucking swimming pool in Florida where a bunch of shrieking necklace stump kids running around with a hypoglycemic sugar rush are trying to stuff jujubes into his blowhole. And wonder why he fucking snapped. But now, he's in, now he has to go on, uh, swim, sleep, do a matinee, swim, sleep, do the evening show. This is fucked. I'm gonna kill someone. And he does. The other story uh, 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 is a celebrity chimp who bit a woman's face off. 
took her nose and her face off. His name was Travis, uh, the celebrity chimp. Travis, the Stanford, Connecticut celebrity chimp. <laughs> Travis, uh, bit a woman's face off. Didn't even know her. He, uh, <laughs> she did something wrong, pissed him off. Now, in the descriptions of this chimp's activity, uh, they listed the various TV credits, because that's what you do in America. You need to know an animal's TV credits before you'll read the story about it. Elephant tramples someone in America, you go, really, what's he been in? <laughs> this chimp, according to what I read, had made a failed TV pilot with Cheryl Crow. <laughs> that's where you gotta, you gotta question Hollywood fucking backstabbing to say it was a failed pilot. We're actually talking about a fucking chimp, okay? The chimp doesn't need to know that it was a bad TV pilot. <laughs> the chimp just knows, I worked with Sheryl Crow. That's good, you know, that's good for name dropping around the fucking zoo or whatever, right? Sheryl Crow? <laughs> but no. Now, it, now it's got this, dig, now it's got this, it failed. Well, what the fuck happened? It didn't get picked up. Travis, sorry. It didn't get picked It's not your fault, it's Sheryl's fault. She can't act. <laughs> because even a chimp has to look at that and think, well, fuck, I guess I'm a failure as a chimp actor, you know. And the other chimps are going, well, yeah, you're no bubbles, are you? And that's, that's what chimp, that is the measure that chimp has to work by. He's no fucking bubbles. Bubbles worked with Michael Jackson. Bubbles had the fucking life. Bubbles was, that's what you aimed for as a chimp actor. You're no fucking bubbles, all right? So he sees a woman, he thinks, I need my own Michael Jackson. So he rips off her face and her nose. He doesn't know any better. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We'll see you again. Good night. One more time, let's hear it for Rich Hall. Come on, there we go. Okay, next up, folks, it is uh, this week's online news and a woman who, much like an England goalkeeper, has spent the last seven days searching for things from the furthest corner of the net. Yes? <laughs> Please welcome Andy Osho! talk to you about all those weird stories that you see on the internet. Uh, the funniest viral I saw this week was of three West Country teenagers who were caught joyriding a double-decker bus. <laughs> <laughs> now, they would have actually got away with it. The police hadn't a clue who had stolen the bus, except that one of the teenagers posted a clip of it on YouTube. <laughs> right? That is Jedward levels of stupidity. <laughs> That's like stabbing someone in the face with your passport. <laughs> <laughs> but let's have a look at the clip. Here it is. <laughs> I can drive cars and lorries, you can't. No, no, don't do that. You rolled the bus over. Oh. How do you feel? I feel good, man. What are you driving? A double decker. <laughs> Where is natural selection when you need it? <laughs> but actually, I was looking at this girl's driving thinking, that isn't bad. Do you know what I mean? I mean, you take a 25 bus around my way, and if the driver doesn't mash up a bunch of cars as he's going along, some old lady would be like, mm, this driver must be new. <laughs> Now, this uh, is my favourite story from the web this week. A 72-year-old man is going to be a father for the 13th time. Aww. <laughs> what I'm thinking is, do 72-year-old men still come? <laughs> no, seriously, though, it must just come out like dust. <laughs> powder bottle too hard. <laughs> like when he comes on his wife's tits, is she like, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, is that why old people's homes are covered in dust? <laughs> yeah, or like, you know when you get an old book and you just open it and you're like, <sighs> Dad! 
Seriously, though. <laughs> what must it be like having sex with a 72-year-old man? Do you think, like, halfway through, he forgets what he went in there for? <laughs> And, like, when he has an orgasm, do you think he makes the same sound he makes when he's getting up out of a chair? Like, oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe they're having some big old, you know, real night of passion or whatever, and he's like, say my name, say my name. And she's like, Arthur. And he's like, who? <laughs> oh, yes, that's me, that's me. No, to be fair, to be fair to him, though, his wife has said that he's a, he's a really great dad. You know, for example, she might say, you know, we're out of nappies. He's like, you can use one of mine. <laughs> we're out of talcum powder. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everyone. That's been my week on the web. I'll see you next time. Shelton in the chair and Mark Watson. Don't go away. Welcome back to Stand Up for the Week. And now it's time for our chair, where we pay tribute in our own special way to, to someone or something that's in the news. This week, we celebrate English football. And so, who better to sit in our chair but a man who has played for England more times than any other footballer in history. He's got 125 internationals. He's more caps than an N-dubs concert. Please welcome <laughs> goalkeeping legend Peter Shilton! <laughs> have to sit tight and enjoy our tribute <laughs> to English football and then we give you 30 seconds to respond. Thanks. Okay? Thanks I was going to say 30 seconds to defend, but you're <laughs> an England goalkeeper. There probably so... wouldn't be a defence. Um, <laughs> your time starts now. Peter Shilton, you are without doubt the greatest ever goalkeeper of England. Yes. Which, of course, this week is a title as prestigious as BP's Employee of the Month. <laughs> yes, Peter, you played for England during what are now known as the glory years from 1970 to 1990. Yes, those glorious years when England won fuck all. <laughs> hey, I'm not saying you're to blame, Peter. <laughs> but much like Mrs Fritzel when Joseph was building the basement... <laughs> always there when the hammering took place. <laughs> in 1986, you were there when Diego Maradona scored his infamous Hand of God goal. But... <laughs> but just like all the other onlookers, you missed it. <laughs> but... Since that moment, you've both <laughs> gone on to successful careers tonight. Maradona's in South Africa on the eve of leading his country to another World Cup triumph. And, and you're in this room that smells of sick and B.O. been insulted by the <laughs> former host of Love Island. Yes! <laughs> we need to get back to the glory days when England fans can once again look forward to being beaten in quarterfinals. And, and who knows? Maybe even semi-finals. <laughs> Sadly, though, that's not going to happen. These days, the only semi-England players care about is the one they take photographs off on their camera phone before texting them to strippers. <laughs> Thankfully, there was no phone sex in your day, Peter. It was... <laughs> it was... <laughs> Yes, it was hard enough to find a phone box that wasn't vandalised. <laughs> and it's always tricky to shove a handset up your arse with people queuing outside. <laughs> He's lasted two minutes. Give it up for Peter Shelton. <laughs> and you now get 30 seconds to tell us all how English football can redeem itself. Well, uh, first of all, uh, just to uh, defend my record, it was eight goals in 16 World Cup games, so I don't think that was too bad. <laughs> and that includes uh, that little cheating devil, Maradona Sambal. But uh, I've got to say, he was the greatest player I've ever played against. 
and um, I would just have loved to have been able to knock his head off at that time. But <laughs> I mean, the one thing we've got to do now is put a smile on everybody's faces. We're not as bad as we think we are. <laughs> Yes, England, you're not as bad as you think you are. You're worse. <laughs> One more time for Peter Shilton. <laughs> OK, time now for our special guest slot where we feature a comedian who's not going to be standing up for the week. He's just going to be standing up and being bloody funny. We're delighted to have him. You're going to love him. Please welcome Mark Watson! <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, wow, what a nice welcome. I hate the sort of aggression that there is in stand-up comedy. You know, we've all seen comedians, where are you from, sir? Birmingham. Birmingham. Oh, I fucked your mum. All this kind of thing, right? <laughs> it's an ugly sort of atmosphere. <laughs> anyway, I suppose I should be more polite than this as a rule. I'm a dad, you know. I'm a, I've got a baby. I, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> That is one of the best things about it as well. It almost just by mentioning it, you pretty much guaranteed a round of applause. Not just in comedy, in life. People are always saying, you've got a baby. Oh, congratulations, well done. Just for fucking your wife. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> you know, she says, well, I, I don't like the word hero. You know, I, uh, <laughs> I was going to do it anyway, but still, thank you. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, it does... Um, it's an alarming thought to think, you know, oh, I'm going to have to set an example to a baby. And also, oh, I'm a dad. A dad is like a different species of person. Suddenly, I've started... I'm 30. I've started behaving almost overnight like a dad. I've started making dad noises, uh, like picking things up and going, Hup, for example. And it's only... It doesn't correspond to anything. It's just a dad noise. Recently, I caught myself getting into a hot bath and sort of going, ay, ay, ay. <laughs> That's not, that's not a genuine noise. That's not, I imagine soon I'll reach the threshold when you're about... Four, there's men of about 40, 45 uh, stop sneezing and just start shouting instead of a sneeze. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> the phlegm element is removed from sneezing and it just becomes a series of terrifying yells. Hey, hey, hey. My, um, my father-in-law, my wife's dad, I shouldn't really tell you this, uh, but my wife's dad, when he sneezes, it sounds like he's saying Hiroshima. Because it, it, it's just... Like, Hiroshima, Hiroshima! The first time... Uh, the first time I slept at my then-girlfriend, now-wife's house. You can imagine, it's a peculiar thing to hear in the middle of the night, really. <laughs> Woken up at, like, two in the morning by my future father-in-law, as far as I could make out, going, Hiroshima! Hiroshima! <laughs> I thought, what? Is, this, is he having some terrible flashbacks to uh, a time well before he was born? Or is this, is this some sort of game? Am I meant to go into his bedroom and shout at Nagasaki back at him? Uh, <laughs> are we playing some sort of atomic bomb mallets mallet? <laughs> incredible, you know. Any time I do something silly now, I catch myself thinking, God, that would be a terrible example to set to my... Recently, I got, I, was getting, I got in a lift, and there's about too many people in the lift, too crowded, about 12 people. It's, you know, recently, all hot and sweaty, and then another person appeared. You know, there's always just one more person, and everyone was thinking, don't get in the lift. I even thought about pressing that, you know, there's a button which shuts the lift doors, which is purely there so that you can see someone coming and think, I don't think so, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There's no mechanical reason for it to be there. The door's shut anyway, but it's just so that you can... So I almost did censor this man from the lift, but I couldn't quite bring myself to. And so all of us watched him get in the lift laboriously. We all had to sort of squelch together even more. I guarantee all 12 people like me were thinking, don't get in, don't get in, please don't get in. All right, you're in. <laughs> but it was only me that out loud said, oh, you fucker. And, uh, <laughs> you know... Yes, it's nice to be able to swear a little bit. I don't uh, normally get to swear that much. And, uh, of course, there's been a hell of a lot of swear. We've heard a lot about sport in this show. It's been a miserable week for sports fans. I think I'm a big sports fan. In a way, I sometimes feel, on a week like this, that as a nation, we just don't, we don't know how to deal with sporting winners. Murray's on the verge of maybe winning Wimbledon. We don't quite know how to deal with it, you know? If you look at... <laughs> Not too many people like him. And there you are. <laughs> that proves my point. Even you look at Paula Radcliffe, one of the most successful sports people we've produced in recent years. What do you mostly remember Radcliffe for? Yes, having a shit during that marathon. <laughs> right. 
and that's a terrible indictment of our inability to embrace sporting excellence. I even admire her for that. I thought that was amazing to have the sheer balls to do that with a watching nation live on TV. The only time I've ever tried to do anything like that during a run, it didn't go anywhere near as well as that. I was nearly banned from the gym in the end. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> It just goes to show, uh, I was just thinking, as you sort of laughed at that joke, I was just reflecting on the subject of language. Balls is an odd thing, you know, it take balls. It is, well, I don't understand where that comes from, really. What's the link between testicles and courage? There's no, he had, but you must be brave, you must have balls. You must say, there's no female equivalent. You never hear someone say, oh, that took Raj, didn't it? What's that? You, so, hang on, you punched, you punched a policeman. Oh, minge of steel, that is. Yeah, just... <laughs> Thanks for listening. My name's Mark Watson. Bye. Hey, one more time, come on. Mark Watson, there you go. That is it. That's all we've got time for in stand-up for the week. We will be back next Friday. Until then, I'm Patrick Healy. Good night. Thank you. Cheers. I watched one woman on the news, she said, as a mother, she was in Swindon, by the way, as a mother, as a mother, I feel a lot safer now that Michael Jackson is dead. <laughs> you live in Swindon! What's Jackal gonna be 